You're listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. everyone and welcome to Give God 90 Radio On Demand. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. It is an honor to uh, allow me some to spend some time with you today as we continue to look at why the nations need to be judged. What is this uh, concern and should we be concerned? What's going on? Uh, if you didn't listen last Thursday night when we were live, uh, both on the podcast and on Facebook at the same time, uh, I would encourage you to go back and look at that because really it gives you some background and I've got a lot of information to go through today. So I'm not going to keep going back to uh, why I say some of the things I do. Please go back and listen to the last one and you'll understand where we're coming from. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I, I mentioned uh, last time that in Deuteronomy 32, 8, it reads, When the Most High divided the nations... Uh, their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. I said that really, there's some question about that uh, translation. And even though it does say Israel in the original documents that we have in the Aleppo Codex, which is the oldest, uh, there is a little bit of concern with that word right there. Uh, because when the Most High divided the nations, <clears throat> when he separated the sons of Adam, of course, it was at uh, right after the Tower of Babel. He confused the language. He drives them all out. And what we're looking at here is this concept of, well, there were no children of Israel at that time, right? It was before... Abraham was really introduced to us uh, just before. And a lot of translations we see and a lot of understandings have this, uh, that he separated them according to the number of the children of God. Now, why does that change things? It changes things because remember in Genesis chapter 6, where it talks about the children of God or the sons of God coming down uh, and... Uh, having children with the daughters of angels. Well, or I'm sorry, the daughters of men. The sons of God having daughter, children with the daughters of men. A lot of times we think about that as being uh, these divine beings that come down and impregnated uh, humans. Well, Yeshua, Jesus himself, uh, kind of puts that to rest when he said in John 3.16, I'm the only one, I am unique. I am the only hybrid of a divine being and an earthly parent. That is what John 3.16 is proclaiming. Also, when we look at Psalm 82, that I went into a little bit, I've gone into detail with it before, uh, but he looks at the divine beings that he is judging as divine beings, and he says, you are all sons of God, but you're going to die like mere mortal men. So we have in that particular verse a little bit of what's probably going to be known as uh, something we, we really are going to argue with for a long time. I kind of take this, and this is, this is me, okay, using all the information I have. When this happened, as there were no children of Israel, and Israel actually means God strives, okay? He, he, he's trying, he, he's, he's striving, he wants to, to accomplish something. That's the meaning of Israel. So when we see that, it's a little different than what we might think otherwise. Uh, you know, we're not talking about uh, Jacob and his descendants here. We're talking more about uh, God divides these nations according to who he hands out, which geographic location to, which divine being is he going to put in control over which geographic location on earth. Okay, now that's about as much 
uh, background as I'm going to bring out from uh, last week. And I say that because I, I promised that we would get to why the age of a nation, how old a nation is, is important and how it affects uh, and relates to the God with the little g, the lesser God, just a, just a divine being, not the creator God, who ro- rules over it. Now, we see uh, Paul get to this just a little bit. And even though he doesn't go into great detail when he explains this, he begins in uh, Romans, and we see what, what happens to a nation. He, he begins this really in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and he completes it in chapter 2, verse 11. And this has all, often been referred to as the downfall of a nation. Now, let's look back through history for just a second. And we don't have to go back very far, okay? We, we can go back and, well, yeah, let's go back a ways. Let's go all the way back to the plains of Shinar and Ish, uh, Nimrod and look what happened. They, you know, Noah's sons, they, they disembark from the ark. The animals spread out. The people stayed in one place. They were congregating. And Nimrod basically takes control. He, he likes to be famous. He likes control. He wants to be treated as a god. You know, we know his lineage. We know whose who's grandfather who his grandfather is. We know all that. And he really uh, usurps some authority there. Everything was good until that happened. You know, things were going as planned until Nimrod chooses to usurp his authority. And he says, you know what? Let's build a tower. And I'm going to climb this tower and be just like God. That's the implication here, okay? All the people said, yep, that's a good idea. You know, our creator looks down, sees what's happening, and he says, I don't think so. I just, nope, that's, this just isn't going to happen. And he confused the language, and he dispersed the people all around the world. Now, once the people disperse, they're in these different geographical locations that these other divine beings have some authority over. What's going to happen uh, as you know? We we look in Psalm eighty two, and and these divine beings uh, actually be uh, are accused of doing something very 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 bad. Okay, and if you hear the pages turning, I apologize. Uh, but <clears throat> what I'm looking for here in Psalm eighty two. Is And this came from the International Children's Bible. It says, God is in charge of the great meeting of his people. He judges the judges. And he asked, how long will you defend evil people? Well, you know, what, we have to ask, what authority did they, did they have? Well, we know what he's talk, who he's talking to are these divine beings who have some authority over these geographic locations. And he says, look, how long are you going to let this happen? Why aren't you doing your job and keeping these people straight? And these lesser divine beings really don't have an answer. They can't answer because they have allowed things to happen. They have allowed uh, corruption. They have allowed evil. They have allowed manipulation. He says, look, you're not, you're not defending the orphans. You're not taking care of the widows. You're not looking after the poor and the suffering. What's going on with you people? I use that phrase loosely, obviously. What's going on with you divine beings? He says, you are all sons of the Most High God. Oh my. But you're going to die like any other person. Because they have allowed uh, sin, they have allowed evil to take place. And if we, I'm going to, I'm going to read 
through uh, Romans 1, and, and we're going to look at it as we go. I'm, I'm going to actually read from Holman today. Uh, there's a couple of people out there that usually listen to this. You're going to be glad to hear that. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, just because this really has a couple of, of really good, accurate translations in it, more so than, than any other um, translation I've seen. It, it has its issues as well, but, but for what we're looking at, it, it, it does a good job. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. Now, of course, he's not talking about two divine beings here. Paul's talking about human beings. Uh, in verse 19, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them for his <laughs> invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. In other words, what Paul's saying is, because God spoke and created, we can witness this. We see it all the time. We see it all around us. There's no excuse for not having faith in your Creator. Verse 21, For though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Oh, heavens, here it is. Uh, I believe when God came down in Exodus chapter 20, and he said, look, do not have any graven images. Paul says, here's your graven images. They knew who God was, but they decided, we're much smarter than God. We can do this, right? Just like Nimrod on the plains of Shinar. We don't need, we don't need the Creator anymore. You have me. I'm, I'm, aren't I wonderful? Let's build a tower so I can walk up into heaven and be your God. That's the implication uh, on the plains of Shinar. Verse 24, Therefore God delivered them over to, their over to the desires of their hearts, to sexual impur impurity. May I start over in verse 24? Therefore God delivered them over to the desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, so their bodies were degraded among themselves. <clears throat> okay, what this, what Paul's saying is it was the authority of the divine beings who had uh, the authority over geographic location, locations to make sure that none of this took place, but they didn't do it. They looked on it as, you know, we've got our own little porn show down here. Isn't this nice? They didn't need television. They had reality, okay? And they let it run rampant. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Now, that couldn't be happening today in the world, could it? Ooh, yes, it can. And they worshipped and served what had been created instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Oh, heavens. Isn't that happening today? Um, let me think for a moment. Do we, in America, in the United States of America... Every Sunday afternoon, how many people get together in front of that little square electric box and they watch and they intently study and they're not studying the Word of God. They're studying uh, little programmed plays of men who are scrambling around chasing a ball of one type or another. That, that is what we're doing today. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what had been created, man in this instance, instead of the Creator 
who is praised forever. Paul says, look, this ain't right. Verse 26, for this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same way also left natural relations with women and were inflamed. Don't you like that word? They were inflamed. You wonder where we get some of the terminology for some of the, the slang we use today? It comes right out of Scripture. They were inflamed for their lust for one another. Men committed shameless, shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. What do we see as a penalty of homosexuality today? What began as a penalty for homosexuality and carried over into the bisexual uh, uh, world and then finally into the heterosexual world? How many diseases began there? with something other than what the Almighty said we should be doing. When we choose to live outside of His instructions, bad things happen. And even though it comes into the, the, the worship communities, it comes into the worship communities because somebody decided they should go outside of God's instructions, right? Right? Verse 28, and because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to, oh, God delivered them over to corrupt mind. He didn't actually send them out there. He let them go on their own. Okay? They're filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. I need to pause here for a moment. Let's look back through a little bit of history. The Greek army, approximately 400 years prior to, uh, well, 400 BC, approximately, was allowed to become strong. Okay, the, the Greek nation became strong. Its army uh, was almost invincible. And they ruled for what we could consider their known world. That area uh, surrounding Greece and, and surrounding some other areas, uh, actually going into Asia a little ways and, and up towards Europe and, and down through Africa, they had a large portion of the world, their known world, uh, and they ran it. They really did. But it only lasted a short while, just a little over 200 years. What happened to them? Well, we know what happened to them. We know what happened to them. The Maccabees, uh, if, you, if you read the, the account of the Maccabees, you can see... What happened to the Greeks because a little ragtag bunch of rebels in a little meaningless, what, what Greece thought was a meaningless country, was able to overtake the entire Greek army and kick them out of their country? That just doesn't happen by accident. The Greeks were very, very good at doing what they did at that time, but because they had actually followed these steps... They, they decided, you know what? We're smarter than God. We're better than that. They became God-haters. They were arrogant, proud, boastful. They invented more ways to do evil. They were disobedient. They were senseless, untrustly, unmerciful. Who, well, I should say it this way. The nation that overtook the power in that land was an up-and-coming Roman nation at the time. The Romans lasted how long? Just a little over 200 years. From their, their rise until things just fell apart. Isn't it something that that can happen in such a quick time? Very, very fast are these nations to rise and very, very fast are these nations to fall. 
look at Great Britain. You know, after the Dark Ages, Great Britain, you know, there was a saying that the sun never set on the British Empire. They literally very quickly rose and had colonies around the world. They were, at one point, practically world dominant. But very quickly, very, very quickly, they fell. They fell. Today, you know, we could say that the United States and and the former Soviet Union struggled. Well, what's the difference between the United States and the former Soviet Union? Other, you know, they, they both were struggling to get their feet on the ground as growing nations within just a, a short time of each other, less than 100 years, right? So as they grew, the United States had a foundation that said, we want to serve our creator God. We, we base everything we have on Judeo-Christian principle. Soviet Union didn't. They, they based uh, what they wanted on more um, idol type worship they they based what they had on you know a person being in charge they based what they had on not so much god given but because I'm the ruler I will allow you to do things so that that nation even though they became strong never developed a true now be careful how I how I say this right they never developed a true world dominance. Even though they are an extremely powerful force in the world, there was no world domination type force there. The United States was. And I know that sounds proud and overbearing, but the re- reality is the United States did project... Um, and I will almost say a reluctant world domination. We see things that the United States did as they tried to help other countries be like us. But if they wanted to go another way, that was fine too. You know, you do, you do, do what's right for you folks. We, we gave them, we gave several countries the opportunity and they turned their backs. Okay. Uh, because they wanted to be more, uh, people oriented. Let's just say it that way. They wanted someone in charge that they could see, they could look at, they could bow down to. And there were several people in these nations who were more than willing to accept that role, right? Just like Nimrod. I know uh, it's a reluctant leader. It's a tough job, but I'll do it. Hey, let's build a tower so I can go to heaven, right? I'll just walk up there and take over the place. Several, several leaders around the world, uh, they weren't as reluctant. They jumped at the opportunity to run the show, okay? Not saying that the United States was always right in doing so, but, you know, history's history. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with real history. The fake history, you know, what you think is history might not be real history. Let's just put it that way. Here's another thing about this. The United States being uh, able to uh, institute the downfall of the British Empire really set the tone for the past just over 200 years now that the world really is out of touch with God. Think about this. Go back to um, Romans 1, verse 32. Although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Do we know any countries like that in the last 200 years? They know what God does. They know... God's going to wipe them out. God's going to judge them. 
but they do them anyway. And when another nation rises up to do this, they don't say, you better watch out. They clap their hands and they hug on each other and they say, oh, it's wonderful. We're not, we're not going to die alone, right? That's basically what they're saying. So now let's look at something else. Let's look at something else. If we go on to chapter 2, okay, we're going to go on to chapter 2. Therefore, Paul says, because of all of these things, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same thing. He says, look, you're no better than anybody else. Remember Moses. God sends him down. He says, Moses, just stand back. I'm going to wipe these people out. They are, they're nothing but trouble. Moses says, wait, 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 wait. If you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out too, because I'm no better than them. Paul picks up on that and he says the same thing here. He says the same thing here. You're doing the same thing they did. Verse two, we know that God's judgment is based on Oh, you notice how I, how I added that there? We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on truth. Ooh, what is truth? If you look back through Scripture, you're going to find out that truth is God's instructions. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? He says, look, don't think for a moment that you're better than anybody else. Do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? He says, look, the only reason you're still here is because he's attempting to give you the time to turn around. He wants to wipe you out, but he's going to give you a little bit more time until, and we're going to look at that in a minute, until it can't be given anymore. Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. Oh, we got to listen to Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Oh, my goodness. Did you know this was in here, folks? I knew this was in here. How many of you are familiar? I'll tell you what, when I get done here, you're going to run to your Bible. When I read this next verse, you're going to run to your Bible and you're going to look it up. Because Romans chapter 2, verse 6, he will repay each one according to his works. Oh, 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 my goodness gracious. There's there's good Christians out there who are going and running for their Bibles right now. Guarantee it. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing so seek glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth Again, the truth is what? God's instructions. While obeying on righteousness. There will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. Now, he's basically speaking uh in this, and I don't really like this particular translation for here, but it works. He's saying, "Look, it, it, he's, he's t because he's talking to the Romans. You know, he, he's got to he's got to name them out by name, right? Because if he says to everybody else, they're going to think, well, you who you think you're talking to there, Paul?' So this is what he's using. <sighs> Chapter two, verse eleven. There is no favoritism with." God. Our creator doesn't play favorites. Our creator is fair and honest. And he says, look, I'm fair. I'm honest. I'm doing the best I can with what you people give me the opportunity to do. And you really, really, really need to understand, folks, 
You need to understand what's going on. Isn't it, isn't it something? Isn't it something? <clears throat> sad, isn't it? It's very, very sad as we look through these things. <sighs> I don't know what you think about such things, but I know what I think about such things. There is a verse, and you're going to need to listen to this very carefully. In Genesis 15, verses 15 and 16, God's talking to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, you will live to be very old. You will die in peace, and you will be buried. After your great-great-grandchildren are born, your people will come to this land again. It will take that long, because the Amorites are not yet evil enough to punish. The Almighty gives us every opportunity to turn around. He gives us every opportunity to repent. He gives us every opportunity to say, you know what, I've lived outside of your instructions and it's not working. I need to go back inside. I tried it my way. It just doesn't work. I need to turn around and I need to follow the Almighty's instructions. I need to live the way He designed me to live because it's just not working when I do it on my own. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that's what Give God Don is all about. Trying to convince you to turn around and live the way you're designed to live. When your creator designed you, he said, if, if this living being will do things the way I intend them to do, they will live a long, productive, happy, healthy, successful life. It's that simple. If you want to see your life improve, you will live according to his instructions. You will, you will find you, when you find yourself outside of his instructions, you'll understand it's not working. That's when your life is absolute, complete chaos. It will turn you inside out, upside down, and you name it, and it will just not go well with you. you you're going to have all the, <laughs> all the drama anyone could want. Now, that's not saying if you follow his instructions, you're not going to have some drama. But you know what you're going to be able to do? You're going to be able to control it. You're going to be able to look at it and say, no, not today. You know, I can bring order to this. I can do this. It's not, it's not, I don't need to be upset with it right now. It's not going to rule my life. The Almighty rules my life. Somebody else's drama does not rule my life. When the Almighty decides to judge nations, there will be people who have been following his instructions in those nations. Those people are the examples to the others around them. Let me say this this way. It's better to be an example for the Almighty Creator than it is to be someone who is leading someone astray. Ladies and gentlemen, just as Paul warns in Romans, there's going to be things that lead nations to destruction. Just as God warned Abraham, there are nations who are not yet evil enough to punish, but there will be. There are warnings throughout Scripture. Warnings all over the place and examples of how to live all over the place. Do yourself a favor. Do yourself a favor. Find those places that are examples. Live according to those examples. And that way, that way, when you are reading Romans chapter 2, and you get to verse 6. And you read, He will repay each one according to the things he has done. He will repay each one according to his works. You know, I, I don't know how many times I hear almost every other day or so. Works don't get you into heaven. No, they do not. 
faith gets you there. Faith gets you there. But if you have faith in the Creator and you really truly have a desire to be in His presence, then the things you do are not going to bring glory to yourself. They're going to bring glory to Him. The words you speak you know, you're not going to be accusing others falsely. You're not going to be saying that leader's wrong and that leader's right. You're not going to be saying, you know, that, that preacher, he's just no good. You're not going to be talking about people and gossiping. You're not going to be unmerciful. You're going to be looking at the fruit that they leave behind. You know, sometimes it takes fruit a while to ripen too, doesn't it? Sometimes... Sometimes, and I have witnessed this, you know, I grew up on a farm and I've witnessed this, you look at a plant and you say, it, it's healthy. It's a nice, healthy plant. And you, you watch the developing, ripening fruit, and all of a sudden, something will infest it. Whether it's a blight, whether it's insects, what, you know, some outside force from somewhere affects it. Sometimes, you know, it comes from the air. Sometimes it comes up through the roots. Sometimes, you know, it, it, it's physical, you know, whether lightning strikes it or whether, uh, you know, people do something. But it takes an outside force to ruin good fruit. I've seen it happen in people. I know I, I have several friends who were pastors and I have watched their lives and I have watched their actions and what started out being very, very good, they were sucked into a line of thought. They were sucked into a belief that's not scriptural. They were sucked into this believing something that just doesn't come from the Bible. It doesn't come from the mouth of God. It comes from the enemy. I've watched it happen. And I've watched their fruit go from developing to be perfect. Now listen carefully to shriveling up and falling to the ground. Absolutely useless. Absolutely useless. I've listened to their sermons in their later years and I've read their writings and I can tell you, they do not quote scripture any longer. They do not point you to your creator. They drive a wedge between not only you and your creator, but you and the people who believe. Though you, that wedge is driven not just between you and your creator. They don't want to separate you just from your creator. They will separate you from the people who are still holding on to the Almighty. They really, really do. And they do it in such a way, if you read the book of Jude, you will see it. You will recognize them, guaranteed. They're the people who speak uh, ill of other people unless they want something. They do everything for their own glory. The downfall of a nation begins... When people say, you know what, I'm much smarter than God. I can do it my way. I don't need God. I can do it my way. Just don't you worry about a thing. That is the downfall of a nation. The United States is dangerously close to that. There are other nations around the world that are very dangerously close to that. If you look back through history, you can witness the downfall of a nation, simply by following what Paul writes in the first, well, basically chapter and a half of Romans. It is sad. It is sad. But the good news is, as individuals, no matter what geographic location we're in, no matter where in the world we happen to find ourselves, we have the opportunity to do what's right. We can live a righteous life. We can live a, a holy and acceptable life when 
we choose to live the way we are designed to live. That's all it takes. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this has been a blessing to you. Please, please, please live the way you're designed to live and have a blessed, blessed week. Thank you.